pode ver cá um pouquinho? Cara, porque eu não tô vendo. Mas já tá assim, cara. Ah, tá. Pô. Mas já tá assim. Ah, não, é um delay, né? Tá. Ok. Hi guys, how are we doing? It's a little bit it's a little bit delayed on my screen, but it's uh it's good to see you guys. So, I just want to do a stream today, and I want you guys to ask any questions because I know I've been a little bit in absentia, a little bit absent from this. Uh, so yeah, really this is like a QA. and a I want as many of you guys to contribute as possible. And yeah, I really want to answer as many questions as you have because I know we haven't done one of these in a while and I'm in a new studio. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be good to do that. So yeah, uh, fire away with any questions and I'm gonna start by just asking, well, I'm gonna start by addressing some of the things that I think are important at this stage. Um, I think the biggest question that a lot of my clients are having at the moment really comes down to what they're going for right now. In terms of is it better to be single or is it better to go into a relationship? Should I be seeking this kind of adventurous lifestyle that I'm seeing in the likes of Tate and you know in all of these influencers or should I be looking for something more stable? And I think what this comes down to, if we're looking for possibly a solution to this problem, is what times are we living in, right? Now, what I've certainly seen in the culture more recently is a push towards more conservative values, right? Particularly in men's help, it's much more about seeking tradition, right? A move back to Christianity and and seeking more conservative values, right? Than before, maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was much more of a push towards the liberal mindset, the freedom, the adventure, going out there and seeking the new. And I think what it comes down to is that balance, right? When we live in stable times, we seek the adventure. When we live in chaotic times, in uncertain times, we seek stability. And that's both true on the macro scale of you know, life in general, as it is on the personal scale in your own life, right? If you've got all of these things up in the air, your finances are uncertain, your health is uncertain, you've got new friends and you're away from your family and old friends, you're gonna be subconsciously seeking some level of stability within that and some level of order to get out of this destabilizing, unstable lifestyle. And the reverse is true in the more stable times. So a lot of the times, we're seeking one answer, right? Should I be for one woman or should I be for many women? Should I look to settle down and find a nice apartment and focus on one work or should I be traveling and adventuring and meeting new people? And I think the insanity and the instability that we feel really comes down to us looking for one solution, right? One answer that's gonna satisfy us for the rest of our lives. And the truth is it's simply not like that. Our time here is temporary. Our time as men, particularly as men who are young and filled with testosterone and, and looking for more, right? It's limited. We're not going to be here forever. And so we develop what I call immortality syndrome. And immortality syndrome is that feeling that we're going to be here forever and we're never going to die. And so if we have an amazing woman or if we have some woman, we're always thinking, well, this isn't exactly what I want. So let me look further. Right? If we've got a good income or we're making more money, we're thinking, yeah, but it's not where I want to be. Right? It's not the millions that I want to have, so it's not good enough. 
And all of that comes down to us thinking that we have forever to gather these resources. We have forever to attain that situation, whether it's with women, with money, or with health. And so what I did for myself and what I advise my clients to do is to really recognize that you're not going to be here forever, right? Think about how limited the time is you actually have on this earth and come up with reasonable, accurate goals for what you can actually be satisfied with. Because it's certainly not nothing, but it's also not everything. There simply isn't time. And if we had that everything, we'd start adding new things. So to recognize that our time is limited, and particularly as young, hungry, ambitious men, that time is even more limited. And as your hormones change, your desires are going to change. So to figure out something just reasonable and, and good and wholesome that we're looking for, that's going to be accompanied by dates. That's going to be accompanied by adventure and traveling. But not to overestimate what you're capable of, right? Not to have these dreams that are so unattainable and not actually what you want and not actually what would make you happy. So I really want you guys to, to talk to me about this and your thoughts. Where are you with your dating lives? The guys of you that are watching now, what's your situation? What are you struggling with? Because when we look at that in its proper place, when we look at it relative to where you specifically want to be and what's going to make you happy, it's much easier to attack it and come up with solutions. So talk to me in the chat and let's discuss this. Because I think for the vast majority of guys, the biggest problem is that they're not deciding what they want. They're letting other people decide what they want. So we look at someone like the Tate brothers and we think, They've got all of this stuff, right? They've got all of this money, all of this access to opportunities, and uh, I don't have any of that, right? And so I'm suffering because I don't have that. I want the cars. I want the yachts. I want the women. And they're letting other people decide what they want because they haven't thought very deeply at all about what they specifically, personally, actually want. And if they did, they would be more confident. They would have more conviction because they would know when they're approaching their day-to-day -day tasks, they would know where it's taking them, right? When it's so open, like, oh yeah, I wanna be a billionaire, I want all these cars, I want loads of women, I wanna be the best, uh, you know, the most charismatic guy in the world. It's like, you never know if you're actually getting closer to a reasonable goal. <laughs> you never know if you're actually making progress because you don't know what you want. You've let someone else define your terms. So you guys really have to define your own terms. And that's really what I want to dig into today. What are your terms? Someone hit me up in the comments and tell me what it is that you specifically are looking for. What's your goal? Where are you at right now? And where do you want to be in 12 weeks time? And let's see if we can figure this out, right? Let's see if we can give you a pathway forwards. Uh, so anybody that's watching, comment in the chat and I'll answer your questions immediately. Um, what I've been seeing a lot is guys a combination, right? When I'm talking to guys who are maybe 35 and up, they generally tend to have a reasonable idea of what they want, right? They say, you know, I want an amazing wife who supports me and she's beautiful and she exercises and she takes care of herself. And they're kind of clear about it. And when I sit down with them to plan that out and to map out how we're gonna help them attain what they want, it's very, very easy. But when I'm talking to maybe younger guys between the age of like 18 and 25, we have such a harder time defining what they want because it's just so all over the place. Like on the one hand, maybe they want to find an amazing partner and they want to be like Iman Gadsi, you know, have a great relationship and travel around a little bit. On the other hand, they want to be single and they want to be with many women. They want to be dating everyone. And it's like, when we're having such a hard time just defining some goals, it's very difficult to actually make any progress towards them. Uh, so for me, I like to think of reasonable goals and then give myself the chance not only to achieve them, but to over exceed, to actually do more, right? To beat my goals. And that way I know when I'm making progress. It's easy for me to look back over the course of a year and see how I've been progressing and see what progress I've made across the different areas rather than simply have this like open-ended, I want it all and I want it all now. I was actually coaching a client last night, like 5 to 10 p.m. last night. And he said that he wanted to do like 30 approaches and it was raining and we were in a shopping mall. 
And so we go out together. I'm like, dude, if we do five approaches, that's great. You're completely out of alignment, right? He wasn't approaching. He doesn't have momentum. He sets this crazy goal and he ends up doing like eight or nine, getting a couple of contact details, a couple of phone numbers. And at the end, he's like, you know, it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't exactly how I'd hoped it would be, but it's good. And I'm like, dude, you had nothing. You were doing nothing before. And now you've got like two potential girls that you can go out on a date with next week. Like we've made huge progress, right? But it's partly down to you to be able to recognize that progress and you need to know what your goals are in order to see how that progress is moving you in the direction that's important towards your goals. So I think if you haven't done that, that's what my guys in the community are doing now. They're focusing on the visualization exercise where they define specifically what it is that they want, not just from their dating life, but from their social life as well. Yes, what does that woman look like that you want? Once you have an idea of how she looks and what she's into and how she acts around you and you act around her, it's much, much easier for you to actually know when you're going out and meeting that type of woman, right? You know what you're looking for, so you know where to go to find her. Are you going to the gym or the library or the streets or the nightclub? But also when you do talk to her, it's clearer that you actually like her when you do. You have conviction in the words that you say because when you're talking to the girl that you've defined as your dream woman, let's say, she, she fucking knows it, right? When you're talking to her, you've got a look on your face like you don't understand, but you're my type, right? You won't understand that I've talked to uh, 50, 60 girls and none of them have hit the mark and you do. And that level of conviction of knowing what you want is very, very attractive. So she sees that. She thinks, oh, there's something different here. He didn't just give me a compliment. I can tell he feels it, right? He knows something's going on. And that almost um, cult leader-like certainty that you have when you meet that woman is very, very intoxicating for her. So that's what you should be aiming for when you go out. It's like, you know when you're screening out certain girls and you know when you're screening in other girls. And it's gonna be rare that you screen them in. But it means that you're not wasting time with the women that you don't like. So I know that the guys of you that are watching this now, some of you are thinking, yeah, but I'm not even going out and talking to them. And I've got all these guys in other areas telling me that I should be using dating apps. And I've got Andrew Tate telling me I should be doing this and just making money. And what the hell do I do? What should I do? Because I'm lonely and I want to meet women, but I don't know what path to take. I don't know how to do it. And I understand that. But I think in that position, you've got to define the most manageable goal that you can. And it doesn't sell, right? This isn't good for me as a creator to tell uh, people online to manage your goals and maybe not shoot for the stars like they'll tell you. And that's not really what I'm saying. You can... But we've got to start where we're at and making the mistake of having this open-ended, impossible goal when we haven't even got you off the line just doesn't work. We need to define the first steps that are going to take you from where you are one step forward. And that's really what I want to help some of you guys do today. Um, so as I said, it's helpful for me if you guys just tell me where are you at right now? What do you need help with? What's the, the, the sticking point that you're personally facing? And, and I can help you with that. Um, a lot of the guys that I've been coaching, speci specifically the guys in the community, they are already going out and approaching because um, they wouldn't be in the community if they weren't, right? So getting you off that mark, getting you to the point where you can at least go out one day a week and do a couple of approaches is super important. But once you get there, the second obstacle that I see is the, the self-talk, right? Being told by yourself a thousand stories that stop you from going up and talking to a woman. This isn't the right woman. She's definitely in a relationship. She's in a rush. I don't want to look stupid in front of these people. Spotlight effect. It's not the right time of day. People are going to think I'm creepy. The police are going to see. Shouldn't do this in this city. You know, times have changed. All of these thoughts start to come in and make us feel like it's not the right thing to do. But what you know the following day is that it was, right? So you can look ahead and say, I know that I'm going to regret this decision of sitting on my ass and doing nothing because tomorrow when I'm looking back, I know that right now was the time, right? Hindsight is, is 20, 20 and 
and that's what we need to pay attention to. But to actually get over these thoughts, you can practically address them, right? If you're getting the spotlight effect when you're going out today or yesterday, you can't fix it. And the way to fix it is to address the thoughts. Because so often we have things coming into our head and we leave them unaddressed and they distract us and they pull us in different directions. They cause that resistance that stops us from approaching. But really what we should do is we should notice them, write them down. What were the thoughts that today stopped me from going up and talking to that woman? Because once you can see them in front of you, you can see the demons that are getting in your way, you can challenge them. What do I mean by challenge them? Well, you can say, okay, spotlight effect. I don't want people to see me fuck it up. I don't want to look like an idiot in front of other people. Okay. But then you think, let's say you're walking down that street and you see another guy go up and talk to that girl. What do you think about him? Do you think, look at that fool who went up and got rejected? Or do you think, respect to that man? Right? That takes a lot of courage. That takes some balls. I wish I could do that. Respect. Right? So you already know that if you're the guy watching, you give the guy props, regardless of how he does, whether it goes well or badly. So it's in our sort of arrogance that we think that everyone else is different. Right? Or it's in the media brainwashing. We're constantly watching the news and feeling like everyone is a certain way. Everyone has these you know, extreme political beliefs that mean that you know, a man can't ever go and talk to a woman. That's not what people are actually like in the real world. Right? So what you'll find when you do go up and start talking to women is if anybody notices, they're smiling. Right? When I go out in Brazil or when I'm in the States or Warsaw where I've spent a lot of time this year, and that's why you haven't seen me in London so much. People smile. If they notice, the guys give me a thumbs up. The dads smile. Very occasionally, some, you know, some old, older woman, 50-year-old woman will shake her head or some grumpy, joyless person won't like it. But the vast majority of your experiences are going to be that it's positive. People think it's cool. People think that it has courage. Everybody's yearning for the time where things were normal where a guy could go and talk to a girl, where people wanted to have conversations. People are yearning for this. And so you've kind of got to be, you got to be that person. You've got to show that it's normal because we're all waiting for someone to tell us that it's okay, right? To show us that it's okay. But who's going to do it if we're all waiting? You've got to be that person. Maybe there's some kid five years younger than you, right? That's thinking, I wish I could do that. And he sees you do it, right? And he thinks, damn, I can do that. You've been that cause point, right? You're improving your own life. You're improving the lives of the, the guys that are seeing you as a role model in that moment. And actually, importantly, you're improving women's lives. Because many of the women, particularly the ones that will reject you or will uh, have some stereotype of men in their mind already, those are the ones that get a chance to see what a positive version of masculinity looks like, right? What a man who does this intelligently and respectfully can actually look like. You can be that cause point that changes the perceptions, not only of men, but of women, right? And make it more accessible for other men to come and, and do this. And we can, we can, to some extent, normalize this, at least amongst guys who have top 20 or 30% initiative, right? Because there are some guys who can't be helped. Um, and I, I, I feel like anyone watching this channel doesn't put themselves in that category. You would be on black pill channels if that were you. But for anyone here, you already know that you're in the top, you know, 20, 30 percent of guys who at least have the initiative to do something. So I've got my first question, walking up to girls at clubs. So, look, the first thing I would say about that, Angel, is... Is a club actually your best option? Because I would say clubs can be great, but if you want to do this in nightclubs, you're fighting against uh, a very steep slope unless you have a table. And if you have a table, it's a very different story, right? If you're going out with a couple of friends, you drop 500 or 1,000 pounds on a table, you've got a massive advantage. You've got somewhere to sit down, you've got somewhere to collect yourself, and what you find is women will start to actually hover around that table, they'll start to come to you and make themselves very accessible and very approachable. But for the vast majority of guys that I see in clubs, myself included, before I fully understood this, it's like they're walking around and, and they're, tr they're trying to skim the club and find a girl who's not got a table or who isn't with a guy at a table. 
and it, it's very, very slim pickings. It's very, very difficult. So I would say that the barrier to entrance in good quality nightclubs is financial. If, you're, if you know the promoter and you can get on a table, you have a good chance. If you can buy a table, you have a good chance. But I think if you're trying to compete in those environments with guys who regularly drop money on tables, regularly have the best opportunities, you're fighting a very uphill battle. And the second thing is like, what are you optimizing for? Because if you are purely optimizing for sexual adventure, then a nightclub can be good. But if you're optimizing for virtually anything else, including dates, it's probably not the best place. Because not only are you more likely to meet women who are, let's say, a little bit confused about what they want and are looking for short-termism, they're looking for an escape from day-to-day -day life, they're looking to drink, maybe do drugs, they're in this phase of their life. On top of that, the environment itself is not conducive to actually connecting, having proper conversation. So you've got to be careful about what you're optimizing for. And if you're optimizing for nightclubs, the best advice I could give you is first make sure you're going to the best nightclubs because it's an interesting reverse psychology. We think that if we go to a bad nightclub, we're going to stand out as the best guy, the big fish in the small pond. But actually what happens is if you find yourself in a cheap, low-key low nightclub, she is actually going to expect that you're like the other guys, right? The you know, fat, goalless, not ambitious type of guy that regularly goes to that cheap bar or pub or cheap club. And so my experience is that bit has been that even when I didn't have any money, even when I was, you know, a young guy sleeping on sofas, uh, trying to get to know London without any substance or any, you know, any, any value, let's say, I still had a better time in the high-end clubs because the average of the guy is so much higher that she brings you up a few notches and the opportunities in those environments are so much greater that the competition between the women is so much greater. So you might have a girl that's not very attractive in the pub thinking she's you know, the, the, the best thing since sliced bread. And in the club, she sort of has a better idea that, oh, there's loads of beautiful women here and so I'm in competition with them. So Agent 47... Cold approach, a girl at a bar, got the IG, had, had the date in two weeks, touchy, intimate, first date, then not second dates, no rescheduling, left it at just let me know when you're free, how to operate now. Uh, forget about it. There's nothing you can do, man. And it's the same for women and for men. Both of us think, both of us think that when someone isn't responding to us, that there's something we can do to make it work. But the truth is, and we know this in hindsight, if she wanted to see you again, she would make that obvious. And if she doesn't want to see you again, she'll make that obvious too. And she makes that obvious by just not responding. If it's not worth her effort to respond to your message, then how is it going to be worth her effort to dress up, do her hair, do her makeup, go out in a potentially risky, dark environment at night and spend money on transport and whatever else. Um, the best thing you can do is firstly understand that if she wants to see you, she'll ne let you know, leave that door open. And secondly, having, having understood that, is to just send her one final message, which is the, the best possible message that you could send, right? So something that is easy for her to respond to if she wants to, it's playful, it shows that you're not trying to force it or push her to come on a date. Just something that is easy to respond to, it makes her smile, and it relates back to the interaction. So it's very difficult to come up with an example of that because I don't know your situation, and I don't think there are set messages that just work and ones that don't. But I would say something that you were laughing about or playing with on the interaction, if she had a very specific color of eyes, and you say, you know, I'm starting to miss that very rare color of eyes, um, would the young lady with uh, the purple eyes... Uh, make herself available to me next week, right? Something like that that puts her in the third person, makes it a little bit interesting where if she responds, she can talk about herself as the girl with the eyes rather than just say, hey, yeah, I can meet you next week. It's playful, it's a little bit different, it shows that you don't need anything, but ultimately to understand that it, if she hasn't responded, it's not, a, it, it's not a sign that she's waiting for the right text message. It means that she's moved on, she's found another guy, or she's just not interested right now. Drop the ego. Don't worry about what it means about you as a person. 
move on with confidence and don't let it affect your sense of perception of yourself because ultimately your job as a man is to be emotionally stable and to move through life unaffected by the opinions of people that don't know you. Next question. I'm always thinking about this. Why should a girl have a chance to an average guy on the street? How can you impress her? Gabby, it's a good question. Um, I think what you're trying to say is, why would a girl give a chance to an average guy on the street? And I think, again, this sort of comes from our perception that all women are just, you know, getting asked out all the time by these guys in Dubai and, and these guys over here. And we, we, we tend to think that the image that we see on social media or from other coaches or from the Tates or things like this is a fair reflection of reality. And the truth is, it's just not. And I know because I'm, I'm telling you from experience, a lot of the women that I've been in relationships with are not the women that are posting semi-nude photos on Instagram and getting 100 messages a day and getting flown out to New York or Dubai. They're just not in that world. Their world is like, I've got a few friends, I've got my family, I go to work and I come home in the evenings and I'm like open to talking to different guys from different places and I don't live in the center of a huge city. Life is just normal and they're not in this world of, of the media and of only fans and Instagram. And I think we're so limited by our perception that the whole world is reflected in that tiny morsel of society. And so you don't need to impress a lot of girls. Honestly, the most, the lowest bar for entrance with Cold Approach, really all you have to do is go up and tell her what you wanted to say and be relatable. And what I mean by relatable is like someone that she immediately feels is not a threat or a psycho or someone that is gonna cause harm, right? And I say that's a low bar but I know a lot of guys who are successful and you know, decent looking and well dressed and well turned out and they don't get results because girls just can't relate to them. They're not 100% sure that this guy isn't a psycho and so it doesn't work, right? And I have other friends who don't have any of that. They're not the best looking, they're not the, the best dressed, they don't have the most interesting conversation at this stage, but they're relatable. Like the girl's like, oh, I get this guy. He kind of reminds me of people I know, friends I've met before, I feel kind of safe and like I can connect with him, like I don't have to hide anything about myself. And those guys have a massive advantage because a lot of girls aren't gonna be interested, but the girls that are interested in them are gonna give those guys a chance. So again, I'm not talking at the highest level here, I'm talking about getting the average guy from zero to one. And from zero to one is be relatable. And be relatable is say what you wanted to say whilst looking in her eyes and showing her that you're not a crazy person. That is honestly like a benchmark that so many guys still haven't hit. And it's so important at the start that at minimum you're relatable. And it's so easy to do um, when you're actually going out and starting conversations. So next question, next question. Uh, I don't know, man. I initiated almost every text until now. She just said okay to my message and just let me go and liked a couple of IG stories last week. She just wants attention and affection. Dude, I don't know why we're talking about it. Agent 47, I don't know why we're having this conversation. You know it's going nowhere. You know that you're wasting your time. You could be us using your time and attention right now on building something, right? On creating an opportunity that will work rather than wasting in your time trying to resuscitate like a dying bird. It's not gonna go anywhere. She is in control of whether she sees you or not. She knows that. And so if she wants to see you, she'll tell you. If she doesn't, she won't. Forget about it, it's done. I love your work and style. Living in Turkey, and it's so uncommon to cold approach here. I do it and even my friends don't have the courage and bravery. Awesome, bro. Keep doing it but don't let yourself get carried away by the responses of other people who don't know you. Many girls are gonna reject you, many girls are gonna go on a date with you and then block you, and you're gonna think, what did I do? What did I say that made her block me? And you don't know. <laughs> the point is, you don't know. There's variables that are in your control, don't scare her, don't be a psycho, and there are variables that are outside of your control. What happened in her day this morning? Did her dog die? Did her ex-boyfriend come back in the picture? 
and you can't control those. And trying to detangle what you can and can't control when you don't know what's going on in her life is a losing battle. And you just want to move on to the next one. Create more opportunities, focus on your priorities, and keep moving forwards. Sleep space. Approached women for over a year, didn't have much success in terms of dates, spoke to you and how focus on your lifestyle, started playing volleyball and solely working on fitness and business. Ideally would like more social life. Should I be speaking to women now or continue to focus on lifestyle? I still don't feel I'm living an attractive lifestyle. Okay, so look, there's a misconception that by showing up to volleyball like once a week is just going to solve the problem. But as men, we tend to categorize things objectively. Like, okay, I did the thing. I went to volleyball. Now what? Now where's my, where's my million dollars and where's my women? Dude, it's about what you do in those spaces, right? Showing up is amazing. It's amazing that you've taken up a hobby. It's amazing that you're going out and doing volleyball now and you're expanding your lifestyle and the opportunities that you're, you're giving yourself. But really, it depends on what connections you're forming within those. Are you enjoying it, right? Are you opening up afterwards? Are you feeling that sense of like, damn, I just played volleyball, I met these people, we had a laugh, and now I'm walking back and I feel more confident? Because that's what it's supposed to do, right? When I started doing jiu-jitsu and I trained in my gym and I got to know everyone who trained in my gym and I organized my HPM events where I basically get all of my interesting, successful friends to dinner and I host it and manage it and all of this, it wasn't just those events that made me better and stronger and made my social life and my dating life and my business even amazing. It was the fact that after planning an event with friends, after showing up to jiu-jitsu and getting beaten up and feeling the effects on my body, I was stronger mentally. I was more sociable. I was more, my standards were higher of who I would let into my life and who I wanted to spend my time around. So it's not just doing the events. It's about what the events are actually teaching you and where they're taking you and what you're learning from them and how, it's, how you're learning about social skills from the way that people are communicating in the volleyball class and that guy that you played volleyball with that you can now meet, meet up with outside of volleyball who's also a business owner and you might be able to do business with him. It's about opening millions of opportunities to yourself and then selecting the ones that might go somewhere, pursuing those and then reaping the benefits of it. So to answer that question directly, you still don't feel like you have an attractive lifestyle. Should you start focusing on your social life? Yes, but you already have built your social life to the point that you have group events with a fixed group of people who you can get to know. I don't believe I would ever tell you to stop altogether cold approaching on the phone. If you're walking to volleyball and you see a girl that you like, you should go and approach her for sure. But I think I know who you are um, and when I spoke to you and what we talked about. And I think if it is you, the main issue you are having is that you still lived with your family and you maybe even shared a room with one of your siblings. And correct me if I'm wrong, and this isn't you, but uh, if it is, you were like sharing a room with one of your siblings and you didn't have any money and you couldn't <clears throat> afford practically anything. And so what I said is that your priority is gaining at least the financial freedom to move out of the room with your sibling, right? And get a bigger room or get your own place in a different part so that you have the freedom to do any of this stuff. Because as, as long as you don't have the money to like rent your own place or go out on a date, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to gain the sense of, um, the sense of like self value, right? The sense of like, oh, I'm actually moving forward in my own life. I can look after people. I can take her on a date. I can buy my sister a nice watch for her birthday, right? You need a level of financial freedom and financial um, accountability to be able to make any of this work in, in the long term. So it's never a good idea to stop working on your social life. You just have to get your priorities right. And those are wealth, health, and love in that order, right? You want to make sure that you, you've got your base level finances covered, that you are training and exercising to keep your mind sharp and sleeping to keep your, your mind and your body sharp. And then you want to focus on your social life, right? And then your dating life. Guys who are cold approaching, who don't have any good friends, it's like, why? You need support from people. Cold approach is amazing and you should never ignore it altogether. 
but understand that fixing these other areas of your life makes cold approach so much easier. If you have buddies who do it as well, guys who support it, financial stability to, to go out to interesting places, you know, interesting bars and museums and exhibitions and stuff like this, that's the base level. And from there, when you're cold approaching, you know that the girl you're talking to, you can give her a good experience. You can take her out. You can do interesting things with her. And she knows that you're the type of guy that has his life in order. Because why would she want to date a guy who doesn't have his life in some sort of order? So this is the priority list. Um, and cold approach comes after that. So sleep, space, does that answer your question? And maybe confirm whether I was right about who I'm talking to, because your name is elusive. So as I was saying before, I think that the best goals to set for yourself are goals that you can imagine achieving at the start, right? If you're not going on any dates, just one date is a good goal. And if you haven't done any approaches and you want to go on a date, then doing your first five approaches is massive progress in that direction, right? So by setting these manageable goals and not getting distracted by these open-ended, you know, 1% lifestyle goals, you can start to see and feel a sense of self-improvement. What I've been focusing on recently is time separating my day in terms of timings as well. Like saying, okay, I've got 8 till 12 p.m. for health, I got 12 till 6 or 7 p.m. for work, and I got 7 p.m. until uh, you know, 11 p.m. for social and love. And that way I know that whatever happens during the week, I'm giving each of these areas enough time to flourish and to blossom. Um, because it's very hard to micromanage your life, but it's also very hard if you don't have any structure right? If you don't have any sense of how much time you want to dedicate. So by splitting it into those three sections, you know that you're giving enough time to your wealth, right? You're, you're dedicating a good chunk of time to building your wealth. A lot of you will be nine to five and it's the same thing there, but making sure that if you are in that position, you're also time blocking your wealth and your love. They are all important. They, you need each one of them to be good, to be living a healthy life and to be living the good life. And so by letting any of those slip, the others start to slip as well. So Agent 47, Gabby Life, and Sleep Space, have I answered your questions? Do you have any uh, comments on that or any uh, retort? And is there, is there anything else you guys want to know? Um, is there anything else you want me to go over and explore in more detail? As I said, I very rarely do these live stream Q&As because the vast majority of the time I'm doing them on Wednesdays for my community and we're tackling a specific topic each time, setting the guys up with a strategy. Um, but I understand that not everyone's ready for that. So I wanna make some time available as well for you guys to actually talk to me and, and get some help. So bling, blong, ding, dong, great name. I've always been a more love at first sight kind of guy. So I struggle even wanting to talk to women I see, even though I think it'd be good for me to finally try dating. Do other guys feel this way? I don't really know what you mean by a love at first sight kind of guy, except for the Disney picture that one day you're just gonna meet the perfect woman and she's just gonna fall into your lap and everything's gonna work. Um, that it's a dangerous mindset to have if that is your mindset because it might actually happen at one point. Before I got into this, when I was 16, 17, it happened to me. I had someone fall into my lap and I thought that that was, you know, the case. And what you realize is that there are very few ways that something is going to work and there's a million ways that it's going to fall apart, right? It's kind of the, the second law of thermodynamics thing. Things without a, an ordered structure tend towards chaos. Things tend to self-destruct. A garden, you have to keep it in perfect order. If you leave it for two weeks, it gets overgrown. And the same is true of relationships. So you might meet an amazing girl and you think she's beautiful and you have a great connection, but what's likely to happen is that after a couple of weeks or months or a year or two, it's gonna fall apart as most things tend to fall apart. And when that happens, you're gonna realize that you can't keep relying on the next perfect girl to fall into your lap. You have to be able to create opportunities. And when you do, 
your standard for what kind of girl you want to come into your life changes as well. And you start to have a better idea of what you're looking for and you start to be able to create these opportunities. So absolutely a lot of guys feel that way, but it's mostly the guys that haven't yet learned that they are the cause point in their life. That if something amazing is going to happen, it's almost always them that are going to have to do it. That they're going to have to suffer. They're going to have to feel anxiety. They're going to have to step up in front of the crowd and do the speech that they were terrified to do. Because as a man, we just have to struggle. We have to suffer in order to achieve real fulfillment, right? So if you are that love at first sight kind of guy, I think it would be a very, very good idea to start doing what is going to cause you that struggle, right? Going out and talking to women, being the cause point, going through the pain, going through the rejection, seeing how often it doesn't go well. So you know that when it does go well, you've achieved it, you've made it happen, and it hasn't fallen into your lap. So don't live with a sibling, but live at home, yes, but agree with you again getting lifestyle together. Yeah, so obviously I have had a lot of conversations with guys. A lot of you guys uh, get your free 15-minute call. You call me up and we talk about this stuff, so it's hard for me to identify without a name who everyone is, but it's the same thing. I think moving out from home is such a big step for so many guys. It's not a problem just with logistics. Like, you know, you don't have a lot of space. You don't have a lot of quiet. You, 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 you know, it's a psychological problem of the anchors when you're living at home you're anchored to seeing your parents as as if you're a child right they know you as the child that was growing up and they treat you like a child and you treat them like the parent that you need to give you advice or the moody teenager and you need to get all of these anchors about your previous self out of your environment in order to start forging the self and the version of yourself that you actually want to be and that you feel comfortable and, and confident in, you need to enter that new environment. And if you're at home, it's basically impossible to have access to your potential growth because you're tied down by the perceptions of your family and parents. So that's a, a big one. Next comment. Uh, like a more intense attraction is what I mean. Um, Awesome, man. Yeah, I know what you mean, that love at first sight idea with a more intense attraction. But how can you depend on that? How can you rely on that? It doesn't make sense to be doing nothing, right? Doing nothing active in order to achieve something that you want and just hoping that that thing is going to come along. Where is it going to come from? Why is that intense attraction going to come to you if you don't go out to pursue it, right? And that doesn't just mean cold approach in the streets. It doesn't just mean going out at night. It means whatever it means. It means going into whatever environment is suitable to the thing that you want, right? If you want an intense, deep attraction early on, what environments are more likely to give that to you, right? Maybe it's on some retreat, right? Maybe it's on some spiritual retreat or some, um, I've forgotten what they call it, but those like sexual access retreats where everyone goes and triggers each other's sexual desires um you're going to get a lot of weirdos there but i think it's going to certainly have a more you know fast and intense connection but it's about us taking accountability as men and saying what do i want and how do i get it actual life strategy and without that we we can't really get anywhere because we don't know where we're going and therefore we don't know why we're going to do that why is a guy going to have the incredible desire that is required to consistently go out on cold approach if he doesn't have an exciting vision of where it's going to take him, a clear and exciting vision. The resistance is just too great. And I'm making a, a video that's going to come out next week on this exact thing. There's like desire and resistance. And these are the two forces that are competing in the marketplace of our mind. And when the resistance is higher than the desire, right, 70% resistance, 50% desire, we never act. Because it's always greater resistance than our desire. But as soon as you get 1% more desire than the resistance you feel, you act every time. Because you only need to be slightly more interested in that thing than the fear or the anxiety that you feel against it. So then the next question is, how do you simultaneously increase your desire and decrease your resistance? And it's exactly what I said. To increase your level of desire, 
you've got to give yourself a visual idea of what you want, right? To give you the motivation and the desire to overcome the resistance. And on the resistance side, it's what I call graded exposure. It's gradually increasing the level of challenge of the tasks that you have to do, right? So let's say you create a visual idea and you say, I want a girlfriend and I want her to be healthy and stable emotionally and active and interesting and support my goals and vision and I want to support her as well. Okay, that's a pretty good vision. Elaborate, right? Make it really clear and visual. And then you say, okay, what's my graded exposure to get there? It might be like, well, to get there, what would be a little bit easier than that? Well, it would be going on two dates a week until I meet her. Okay, how do I get two dates a week? A little bit easier than that. Okay, uh, maybe I need to go up to 30 people a week. Okay, but that's impossible. So how am I going to do easier than that? 10 people. Easier than that? One person. Easier than that? Leave the house. Just step outside. Right? And when you get down to that base zero, it's like step outside, make eye contact with people around you, see a girl you like and smile at her, give a passing compliment to an old lady. Okay, do an approach, but you only have to give her a compliment and then you can run away. And you create this chain of events that leads up to the goal, right? And so normally what we're doing with that is we're saying, right, guy wants to go on one date a week. He'll need to approach about 25 to 30 women in the right way in order to get a date at the level he's at. How are we going to get him to do the first approach? And we work our way up with something a little simpler. But that actively decreases the resistance that you feel by giving yourself manageable steps like a frog jumping across the lily pad to get to the other side of the pond. He can't jump straight across, but he can jump just to the first lily pad. And then on the desire side, it's having that clear visual idea in your mind because once you have it, you know what you can get excited about. What are you getting excited about that's going to cause you to take the action if you haven't, desi if you haven't defined an exciting visual image in your mind. So that's really as simple as it is. I think that applies to all of you, Gabby, Agent, Sleep Space, and Bling, Bong, Ding Dong. So guys, any other questions or any feedback on any of that stuff? Because I think it's so valuable. So many guys just try and start approaching before they've done any of the work that's required to get them there. And it's like a guy starting a business without a business plan or without an idea of where they want the business to go, or the how they want it to evolve, simply not going to work. It's just not going to work. Where are you going? What's your next step? You don't know because you haven't defined it. So that's the main thing. But I want to kind of bring this back to the topic. And the topic of the conversation is what should you do, right? What should you do as a man trying to date in this age? And I really think that we are in unstable times, right? For almost all of us, it feels like we're in a, a time of change, a time of flux, a time that politics is changing, the world's changing, things are tense. It's like a Cold War period where no one knows what's going to happen next. And I think to adapt to that, we almost have to enact that bell curve in our own life. And by seeking, at least seeking, some level of stability in the women that we're looking for, right? Maybe not a relationship, but just someone that you can meet up with regularly, not three or four people, it's, it's much more manageable and much more visual and visceral for us to focus on that as a goal, right? Finding one girl that you just get on with. Even if eventually in the future you might want to have the crazy dating adventures, right now, just set your focus on finding one person that you like, that seems to like you, that you can meet up with on a semi-regular basis and form some sort of connection with. And I think that is an antidote to the chaos of, of everything, including the sort of, yeah, political turmoil that we see with regard to men and women and dating and, and everything, everything along those lines. So <clears throat> I'm going to ask you guys to, to send me more questions. I want to be able to help you guys out as much as I can one by one. And your questions help other guys as well to solve their problems. So many of the problems are going to be the same or at least symmetrical. So I'm going to move on to Amir. Thanks for your advice. I feel so drained doing everything on my own. I gain energy from being around others. I struggle to do things alone. Yeah, I mean, most, I mean, almost everyone is the same. We have this idea of introverts and extroverts, and I think a lot of it is just culture. 
It's like COVID, everyone was an introvert. Everyone was stuck alone. And everyone started feeling nervous or exhausted after having a conversation because their lifestyle was so attuned to being alone that we had these like situational introverts and we, have, we had situational introvertedness. And a lot of guys that were cold approaching forgot how to do it or just couldn't do it after that because they'd become an introvert. But I think for almost every guy, they're better around a tribe of guys who they get along with, who supports them, who they, they feel almost like is a part of them, right? They feel like it's, they're reflected in their friend. They laugh at the same things. They have the same sense of humor. They're going towards the same goals. It's so important to be doing what you're doing among people who are doing similar things. You need that motivation. You need to be able to motivate them. You need that sense of validation, right? Validation is a taboo word, but we need validation. We've relied on it for our entire evolutionary history, validation from the tribe, because what's the opposite of validation? It's that we're unvalidated by the people that we literally rely on for our own survival. We didn't survive if we were alone. We only survived in the tribe. If the tribe de devalidated what you were doing, you didn't survive. You were an outcast. You died. You got eaten by wolves. So we got to find that. In a world where we don't have a fixed tribe, we don't have a physical geographical tribe all the time, we got to use our resources to find that. And you want to find guys in your area that have similar goals to you, that are on the same path, and that you know you can look to when things are getting hard, but they're still going, so you're still going. You don't want to go to the gym, but they're going to the gym, so you'll go to the gym. You don't want to do those approaches this week. You're tired, but they're going to do them, so you got to do them. Because if they get ahead of you, what does that mean for you? You're no longer that valuable, really, right? If you are not doing anything, if you're not taking action on your life, you've got to be able to provide your people with value, whether it's your family, your friends, your relationships, um, friendship is based on value exchange. That doesn't mean that we don't unconditionally love that person. But as you all know, there have been times in your life where you're around people who just have so much more than you, right? They're so much more uh, financially successful, knowledgeable about the world. They, they've, they're better physique. And you feel this sense of like, damn, I, I, what can I offer to this person? And even if they like you, it's going to be difficult to maintain that relationship if you're not providing them with any value. That value could even be humor, right? You always make them laugh and they need a break, you know, a break from all the hustle and the work. And that's still a value exchange. But we need a tribe of people with whom we can build our own value. We can help them with some areas. They can help us with other areas. That sense of tribe is super important. And if we don't have it, it's more of a priority than dating. It doesn't mean it's, they're mutually exclusive. It doesn't mean you drop dating altogether, but it means that if you're gonna prioritize one of them, it's finding the guys first and then finding the woman second. But you should be doing them concurrently. Like uh, Sleep Space said, going and doing volleyball, going into that volleyball class, going into the jiu-jitsu class that you that you're scared to do, you don't wanna get beaten up on your first day, but moving into those environments so that you have a chance to meet other guys with similar goals, with like minds, and then from there, you can meet them outside of the class, you guys can help each other and push each other forwards. So social settings are super important, even with cold approach, because without the social setting, we're just this, we, we, we don't have the support, we don't have the stabilization, it's, it's so difficult to do any of this stuff alone. And every successful businessman will tell you the same thing. Every guy that has social success has great relationships and everything else. He always has a network that's helping him to do it. Because how did he get into the club on the table where he met that girl? Or how did he have the courage and the knowledge to go up and talk to that girl? It's, it's virtually impossible to do any of this by yourself. So if you feel like you're by yourself, you are, you're gonna exhaust yourself and you're gonna burn out so quickly because you need the support of other guys to keep the momentum and the energy. Um, how do I join this network? Well, it depends what network you're talking about. I have tried very hard to provide this network to guys through the Fluid Confidence System and the link to that's in every video, below every video. Anyone gets access to that for $1 for the first week. And the reason why it's not free is simply that if it's free, 
you don't feel in any way invested. So I charge the minimum, which is $1, just so that you know there's a physical transaction there, right? Because that is actually important to the way that you do in there. If I made it free for everyone, the reality is this, right? And it's, you might think like, oh, it's easy to say that from this position, but the reality is that if it's free, people don't value it. I once got Grant Cardone's course for it's a 10k course right people pay 10,000 for it and I got given it for free I was like damn that's amazing a year later I found it in my drive and I'd never looked at it because part of us investing in something is that there's stakes right there's skin in the game and so when you're approaching it's the same thing if there's no stakes if you don't need to to make friends or meet women if you don't feel loneliness if you don't feel an intense desire to change you're not going to do it. That's a stake. And the same is true here with the community. Um, so I've tried to make that community, but I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody to come and join because I, I don't want to. I don't need to do that for myself and I don't want to do it for you because if you feel like it's helpful, you can come by yourself. But I'm not going to tell anyone to come and to come and join. But I do have guys in there that are doing this stuff, right? Guys across Europe. We've got Gonzalo in Lisbon, we got five or six guys who are regularly coming to the calls in London, meeting up with each other, guys in the States. So that's one good way. The, the other way that you can do it is like Sleep Space mentioned. We had a call a few weeks ago or months ago, and I said, just do something, right? Go out to that volleyball class, go to that dance class, go and do your first Brazilian jiu-jitsu class, and you'll see what a tribe or a community looks like because everyone in there respects each other at minimum. No one's stepping on the mats in shoes. Everyone is, is sitting down and listening to uh, the sensei or to the instructor. There's a deep felt sense of respect there, right? But you could find that in a yoga class as well, if it's the right one. You could find that in gym buddies, right? There's a guy working out over there. He's doing deadlift and no one else is. You like these exercises, so you go up and talk to him and say, dude, it's good to see someone doing lifting correctly and, and doing the right exercises. Everyone else is just using machines. Form a relationship with him, right? Some of these environments we don't even think about, right? I had this experience in London where one of my friends came over from America. This was like only a year and a half ago. And I was walking to my house with this guy back to you know, where I was living. And he was approaching all around there. And I was like, what? This is where I live. And subconsciously, even though I was still approaching a lot, in that specific area, the 100, 200 meters around my house, I'd completely switched it off because I associated it with you know, work, rest, and play, but not with approaching. So you might be going to the gym, and there's amazing opportunities to meet amazing people all around you, but you simply don't yet associate that environment with a place that you can cold approach. And that's maybe what you need to change right? You might start to think, okay, let me take perspective. Look around me. Which of the guys in here do I, would I want to talk to? Which of the guys are lifting right? Which of the guys look interesting? And then how would I get into that conversation? Maybe I'll just go over and say, hey, man, I've been coming here a few weeks. Haven't seen you yet. Uh, just wanted to say, like, what's up? How's it going? And it's, yeah, it's cool to see someone doing the right exercises the right way. If you're into calisthenics, it's a really good way because as soon as you see someone using gymnastics rings or doing handstands, you've already got a great opener because you've got that niche interest. So locating niche interests in these environments, if you go into a bookstore and she's looking at the psychology section and you know something about psychology, it's another niche interest that gives you a really solid, stable way into the conversation. So yeah, that's how you deal with burnout, bro. You need a bunch of guys who might be feeling the same way, and that's how you resolve the burnout, right? If you're feeling tired, but there's another guy that's feeling tired, and now you realize that you're not the only one, you've got support, you've got someone in the same boat, feels a hell of a lot better. Um, and laughter, right? You need people who you can laugh around. If you're going through days without laughing, you're becoming serious and stiff. When you have outlets every day to help you become more open and, and humorous and introduce comedy, you're going to see that reflected in your life at large, right? You're going to find that you become more funny. You become more loose. Laughter begets itself. You laugh at one thing, you become more laughter, right? You, you have more laughter. You become more funny. The people around you are laughing and, and playful. So that's how you do it, bro. But guys, I've got, to, I've got to wrap this up. So I'm going to take like one or two more questions if you guys are ready in the next 10 or 20 seconds. 
Otherwise, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, we've gone over some important topics today. Firstly, what should you do if you're a man in the 20, 2020, 23, and you're trying to improve this area of your life? The first thing you should do is figure out what you want, because if you don't know where you're going, you don't know how to get there. The second thing you should do is figure out what are the actual obstacles that you're facing. Is it that first step of going out and cold approaching, graded exposure, make the, the smallest first step that you can take, the first lily pad, walk outside the house, make eye contact with someone, you know, say hello, give a passing compliment. Make it super easy for yourself to access this world, to get to that next step. The next thing that, um, that to think about is like, what is your specific visual goal, right? What kind of woman do you want? Because if you're going out and approaching, the women that you like are going to know when they're the woman that you like, right? It's going to be written all over your face when you've defined your type and she is it. And also you screen out the women that aren't, right? The women that feel like, oh, he, he, I didn't get any vibe from him. It's because you're not attracted to her. You just don't know that because you haven't defined what you like, right? Defining what you want gives you certainty, gives you conviction, gives you charisma, and uh, it's going to massively improve your communication. What brand is your t-shirt? Um, Uniqlo, bro. But uh, don't go and buy it, man. We don't want to be wrapping the same, the same clothes. You know, it's Uniqlo. They've got some good stuff. They've got some dodgy stuff as well. I have results, but I'm completely burnt out, and my new job is draining me so much. Sometimes it's like that, man. Sometimes we just got to do what we got to do. And the only respite is that if we can get through it, someone else might not have. And all we can do sometimes is keep on keeping on. I know the feeling. It feels like you're battling against the tide. You're doing one thing, made this money, and now this payment comes in and you're back to ground zero. You talk to these girls. You, you spent so much of your like, courage, time, and energy working up to do this and nothing came back to you. It feels like you're just treading water. What I would say is when that moment comes that you feel like nothing's going to work, you, know, you feel like the money's not going to come, you feel like the, your body's never going to change however much you try and get to the gym, it's always at that point that the world is testing you. It's always at that point that the world's saying, give up now, give up now, give up now. Ah, he gave up right? But if you push past that step, it's the next, the next little bit of action that's going to reap the rewards. So it's always just before we're tempted to give up, just before we give up is where you're going to get the reward. So if you can remember that, you know how you're going to get ahead where other guys would have given up. And in your case, it's that. So get that balance. If the work's taking up a lot of time, you need to find a way to balance it out, man. Even if that means waking up an hour earlier, meditating, getting your exercise in earlier, you've got to change it up, right? You've got to find a way to manage that if you're being completely drained by work. You've got to give yourself something to look forward to. But most of all, don't let yourself go into black and white mode. It's not working for me, so I'm done with this. It's time to just push through that final step, find the life balance as much as you can, and you will be rewarded. I already have it, sorry. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Thoughts on other coaches out there? I don't really like to talk about other coaches because I don't know them and um, who am I to, to tell you what, who's good and who's bad. Um, there are a lot of coaches I'm on very friendly terms with. Most of them I have a lot of respect for because I understand the process and I know what it takes. <clears throat> and I know what imposter syndrome feels like. Um, and so I know that a lot of comedians have the same thing where they feel, you know, my job is to go out and be funny and they have a sense that, you know, who am I to stand up there and like, entertain people so I, I think a lot of the coaches have a lot of courage I think they have a lot of ambition um, and so I mostly respect them but obviously there's guys that I think are going down a bad path and guys that are going down a good path so I'm going to leave it at that I don't want to talk about other people behind their back um, but thanks a lot for for coming guys I hope that this was valuable and um, yeah and I, I I really genuinely want you guys to get off ground zero because I know what it's like to be there and I want you guys to start taking action I do believe that the most important thing about cold approach is not the results I believe that it's the most direct way that a man can feel like the cause point in his own life we used to have conquest we used to have wars we used to have 
outlets, rituals from boy to man, and we don't have them now. And so many men are walking through life feeling like they don't have an effect on the world, that they they don't have a purpose, that they're not useful. And I do believe that cold approach is the most direct way that you can see that you have an effect on the world, that the actions you take, that the energy you put into the world is reflected back to you. Cold approach is the most direct. Fighting, jiu-jitsu is another great way to do that. But in terms of being direct, jiu-jitsu takes weeks and weeks and weeks, months, to even get to the first move that works. Cold approach is right now. If you can walk outside the door and go and start a conversation with anyone, you're going to see immediately that you have an effect on the world. And that's empowering. So that's why really the primary reason why I believe that this is such a, a powerful thing to be learning and so needed in the world now more than ever, both for yourself, for the men that might look up to you, and for the women that have a misleading perception of what masculinity looks like and what men look like. You've got to be that cause, guys. So go out and do it, and I'll see you very soon. Peace out.